much. Um, so good morning. Uh, today I want to speak about mostly about adversarial robustness. And uh, I don't have a good gauge, so I talked, you know, I have a few samples of the student set. And I asked a few people uh, what they know about adversarial robustness, and I've decided to st take a step back and also I will introduce some of the things with the neural tangent kernel that we have done. But I also want to give you um, some intuitions and some maybe even overview of the field. So for those who know that field well, it might be a bit boring, and I apologize. But I do think actually that among the many problems that we face and that we see in deep learning, adversarial robustness is I mean, in my mind, one of the most interesting, but more pragmatically, it's one of those problems that actually haven't been solved. So if you think about deep learning, okay, we don't understand it perhaps, although we, you know, we're advancing our understanding with the tools also that are presented here, um, but it kind of works. I mean, you know, we have these classifiers, they classify images, there's these big speech recognition, translation systems, uh, it kind of works. We don't understand why, but it works. But adversarially robust systems don't work. Or, I mean, they work somewhat, but it's way away from what we would want them to be. So here is not only a problem that we actually want to understand, but it's actually also one that we would like to help solving. I mean, we as the community. Uh, and it, it has many interesting challenges and many also interesting math, I find, because deep learning is kind of optimization, it's min. Right, min of something, we're trying to find a minimum in our landscape. And what is adversarial robustness? It re relates, relates beautiful to what Mike Jordan was talking about. It's about finding min-max, right? finding saddle points. That's what adversarial um, robustness is, if you wish. So I'll, I'll go into this a little bit. And uh, maybe the tools that we have seen uh, here with the neural tangent kernel for the kernel formulation, maybe they allow us to solve this min-max problem in a more elegant way or in a better way, I'll speak about this too. Um, so that's basically the general framework. And what I let's, let me just give it away and relate to what, what we did yesterday. Perhaps you remember uh, that we wrote down, so yesterday we did data distillation with kernels, right? Data set, I should say, data set distillation with the NTK. And, TK. and even there, by the way, some people came to me afterwards, even in the, in the stuff I presented yesterday, how to distill data with the neural tangent kernel, even there, there's lots of stuff that isn't understood. What are we actually approximating? Are we approximating kernel in some metric or just the loss function, you know, all that stuff. It's so new that there are open questions that simply, you know, you can sit down and do some math and maybe uh, understand them better. But what we wrote down yesterday, I think I need to do the glass thing. Um, what we wrote down yesterday um, was a loss function, which we called the KIP loss, right? Where we tried to optimize a data set which we called xs, um, such that the following loss function, with uh, you know, the using the following loss function, xt, xs, 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 right, minus one, ys. This is the square loss, and we tried to optimize it yesterday by finding a data set that is the argmin of this loss function right over all data sets. Remember? And these, these were what we thought of as the distilled data. And this is what we imagine is a surrogate for training a neural network on it. I mean, kind of this, this piece here. And then this whole thing is a surrogate for evaluating this neural net on a real data set to see how well we have learned, right? So this is all a surrogate way of, of optimizing for this very complicated um, uh, kind of meta problem of data set distillation, right? And then we showed that with the kernel, with especially with the currently available analytical expressions for the kernel, this is a problem that we can just throw in the computer and solve and in their case get state of the art, right? And now, what is adversarial robustness, right? Let me just write it down and then I'll start a whole uh, overview. So what would adversarial robustness mean? So 
let me just maybe show one slide. This is the algorithm. Oh, so let me just, so what I wrote down here, that was the algorithm that corresponded to it, right? So except here they did a little bit of trickery where they didn't use the whole data set XT, they used batches of it in order to compute things, and they used batches of this XS. This was just for computability reasons, and they also rotated kernels in order to get a bit more diversity in their, in their data set, okay? But that's the algorithm that corresponds to minimizing this loss, all right? So what is adversarial robustness? And what, what I want to do is I'll give you a bit of an overview because we need to do some math and actually, actually more importantly because we want to build an intuition. I'll give you a sample complexity separation which I think really beautifully gives an intuition why adversarial, robust, um, adversarial perturbations are a problem. And then I'll talk about kind of the state of the art and more intuitions of why this is a hard problem. That's the plan for today and also give you our, our KIP algorithm. So I should say, Whatever follows now is work that is done with Nikos and another student uh, basically now. I mean, this is work that we submitted to a workshop that is uh, at, at the current ICML workshop and hopefully we'll you know, build on it and submit it further. Um, but you can find it on the archive in particular. All right, so just to set the stage, what are adversarial attacks? You all, who hasn't seen this picture? Uh, the other way around, who has seen this picture? Okay, everybody has seen this picture. So what is adversarial um, vulnerability is deep learning works great. It's, yeah, it's not fully sure it's a panda, but it kind of knows it's a panda. So definitely panda is the top response. And then you do a tiny perturbation. You and I look at this, it still looks like a panda and the, the thing is totally sure that it's a gibbon. So that's what it means. And if we wanted to write our, so I'm going to write it now and then we'll discuss this much later, but if we want to use this type of framework to try to solve for it, one thing we could try is produce data here, distilled data, such that we become robust on the real data. Okay, so let me write this down and then I go into adversarial robustness. So what we, what we, uh, what we optimize would be a different loss adversarial KIP, right? What will we be doing is the same loss. Except here, he'll write a delta, okay? Um, tilde maybe even, okay? Excess. Right, so here we would want to optimize our data set XS, but now our goal is different. We don't just want to learn, we want to perform well on a perturbed data set. So what that means is that this delta tilde here is the argmax, argmax of a loss, and delta is a perturbation which I, I, will, I will, you know, go into much more detail, but just for those who want to see the final output. Sorry, delta XS. So what we're doing is we're trying to perturb some loss function with adversarially such that um, that loss gets as, you know, as we, we try to change it, make it as bad as possible. So we find within a data, within a neighborhood of our data set, so let me say this is a neighborhood of our data set XT. Within our neighborhood, we try to find a perturbation such that Oh, yes, sorry, you're absolutely right. So you are uh, zero, <laughs> okay. Yes, and I, I will, come, I will, I will re come back to all this in a more standard setting in a second, but just to, to tell you what the, the neural tangent kernel can do for us here, or generally kernel methods, would be 
to try to find a data set. So optimize this with respect to access such that, so this becomes min-max here, right, saddle point problem, such that any perturbation of the training data set as bad as possible still makes us learn fine. Okay, so this is the kind of um, kernel formulation of the of the data set, I mean, the, the analogous thing, but for adversarial robustness, which we then, you know, solve, and I'll give you more results, okay? But just so this is the kind of giving away the, the message, but let me now go back to adversarial robustness and give you a little bit of a history and some intuitions. Yes? So, we, we find it's min-max. So first, we want to find a data set such that when we learn on it, we are good even if we perturb our data set by delta and the perturbation is chosen in the most malicious way possible by making the loss function, which we usually minimize. So this can be some, you know, can be L2 loss or entropy loss or whatever. Did I write this right? Uh, oh, I know why you're all confused and I'm confused. I should have written comma yt, exactly. Thank you. Yes. No. So this is one thing people can actually vary the loss functions, but let me get into this later. So sometimes this is the entropic loss, and this remains uh, an L2 loss. I mean, um, cross entropy. Uh, you can you can play with the loss functions, which is why I wrote two different letters. But uh, often this is cross entropy, and we also use cross entropy here um, between what the thing would predict on the worst possible. Right. We're trying to mess with the data to make it as bad as possible to maximize this cross entropy, which should be small, but is large. And then we try with respect to that to find the best data set to train on. I'll get, I will, I will, you know, I'll make a big tour and come back to this um, shortly. Okay. All right. So just uh, to impress upon you why this is an important historically. So people, you know, were building neural nets and everything was good. And this is 2013. When this paper came out where this panda and gibbon is a cute example, this is an even cuter example. Uh, this comes from <laughs> 2013, where it's a pig and tiny bit of noise, an airliner, and that, this led to this famous statement, which you probably all heard, which says deep learning makes pigs fly. You've seen this before? No, okay, so deep learning makes pigs fly. This is meantime nearly nine, nine years old. Um, were again the same phenomenon, it's a pig with very good confidence, tiny bit of perturbation, airliner, okay? And uh, the point here is that there are tons of such examples. Uh, and this is from, uh, uh, I actually don't know where I took it from, oh yeah, from that paper there. Um, so people, you know, they can take it to any, any stage they want because it's, uh, there are many ways to generate adversarial examples. Here you, really the perturbation is invisible to the human eye and this thing, the, the car, the self-driving car, will think it's a flower pot and not stop, right? Okay, you see, oh, you see flowers? Okay, but they're in the background, right? I don't know. You see flowers? Maybe. Okay, so Lenka would be, uh, you know, a good, uh, we should put her into every self-driving <laughs> car in order to. <laughs> anyway, so, so this is one, and... Uh, we recently had a talk at NYU, actually. This is the shapeshifter work where they do this. This is just a frozen image, but they do it for videos and they show that you can hide that stop sign and the thing, you know, this, Jan was showing these, right? Jan was showing these videos. So this is a part of a, it's a frame of a video that shows that the thing will consistently misclassify it. And you, you can find adversarial examples everywhere in, in reinforcement learning systems, uh, everywhere. Everywhere, so it's it's really a pervasive. It's not just some pig. It really happens everywhere. It's a big problem. What can I say? And uh, just as a teaser, um, these examples tend to be quite um, transferable. So you produce adversarial examples with one model, say, and I'll come to this in a second. How you do it, and then they tend to be also bad for other models. For this, I mean, for completely different models. So they are very transferable, they are kind of universal. And we'll see in a second mathematically where the intuition for this comes from. Uh, and in particular, what Nikos and I did, so we were actually surprised uh, when we started working on this about whatever, how many months ago, but less than a year. Um, we were saying, okay, what can the NTK tell us about adversarial examples? And the first thing we tried is to use an NTK. So we just produced the kernel of some, actually a two-layer network, 
right? And we made adversarial examples with that one. And they look like this. So they look like all adversarial examples, and they managed to also fool normal neural nets, I mean, finite width. So this is just a cute uh, example. Um, but, uh, you know, so NTK, what can NTKs tell us about all this adversarial business? And there is, you know, this is just a start. There isn't so, so much that, I mean, there actually wasn't so much. We realized there wasn't much work um, using NTK tools to understand all these problems better. Okay. But uh, now let's go and see what the actual, where the intuitions come from and why, why this is all happening. Okay? Yes. Yeah, yes. This, this will be, uh, Nikos, can you remember what this will be? Uh, uh, Big, whatever. This will be misclassified, airplane. yes. Yes, sorry? Is airplane. Airplane, oh, I'm sorry, yes, I should have said that. So this would be airplane, yes. Um, but it's produced with a kernel, for what it's worth. Um, anyway, I think um, I, I won't need this for, for a while, so maybe let's put it up, and I'll give you some intuitions. So again, let me say that many things really go wrong when you try to optimize robustly, right? For instance, um, many things that you love and cherish that when you optimize and then you fit and then you fit 100%, but you continue optimizing, right? We know this and it actually is good for generalization. This type of result we all love and cherish. Turns out it's not true for adversarially robust optimization, for instance, and, you know, very little understanding why and how there are really lots of open problems, also from a theory perspective, not just build a better one, but understand what's going on. It's really interesting, and it relates, of course, the field, there is a field of adversarial optimization, which predates, you know, I mean, people have been working of trying to make things uh, robust in, a, in an epsilon ball, so to speak, and, of course, for the convex case, there are some solutions, but this thing is highly non-convex. So it's really a challenge also from an optimization perspective to even just do it, even if you want to brute force, just invent new methods to do it. So it's, there's lots of really interesting challenges and interesting math going on, but let's, let's start simple and build the intuition. So let's first define what an adversarial example is. Adversarial example. Right, so what is it? Um, um, when we have a classifier, F, right, that goes from, say, RD to Y, uh, even RC, so I have a multi-class even classifier, then X tilde is adversarial, say, if first it's kind of close, X tilde, is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so this is very general. What does it mean? What do people do with images? Mostly for image classification, they say as long as every pixel is within a tiny, tiny distance of its original, we call this a small perturbation. So what does it mean? It's L infinity. So for images, uh, this distance here, D is often some norm. For images, it's often L infinity. But in general, people use P norms. L2 norm is quite frequently used, um, LP norm in general. They give slightly different results, but I mean the philosophy stays the same, mostly. Um, and you could also, people have also studied, I, I don't know if most of you were at Mathieu's seminar, Mathieu Biard, and remember how he uh, shifted these images, he made these, he had the spring model on images and used, looked at these transformations. So people have also looked at this type of transformation. I mean, there's lots of work on this, but just any metric you like, but uh, generally think of it as L infinity. Okay, so that's the one thing. And then the other thing is, of course, that the, uh, the classifier misclassifies, which is the annoying piece. So this is an adversarial example, right? Uh, Oh, I see. So this is uh, RC. I mean, I'm thinking. Oh, it's a vectors. Okay, let's. Okay, make make my life easy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, this is when you think of a classifier. So what I wrote down here would be instead of R, it would be the set one up to C, right? If it just spits out the label. But in ours, yes, you're right. So in in your thing, it's maybe uh, what would we like? Maybe, I actually don't want to go into it, but to kind of too large, large. 
something, misclassifies, whatever that means for linear regression um, or for, for regression problems. Let's, let's stick with the, with the label and just say it misclassifies. It gives a different label, OK? Um, right. And uh, how do you find these things? I mean, what would you do to find these adversarial examples? I mean, this already suggests something. Uh, and I already wrote it there. So x tilde should basically be, in some ways, if we want to find one, and we have defined our, our distance, our metric, then it should be the argmax uh, of x tilde minus x in our metric, whatever it is, smaller than epsilon, right, of the loss function of x tilde y. Right, so these are how we would find these. How would we find them? We would try to find those where the loss function. F of x. Oh my, OK, sorry, absolutely. Yes, right? So that's what we would do to try to find them, right? OK, so then, the, I mean, if you, it's actually quite, yes? If, if it's a classification problem, how do you know that such things exist within epsilon? Uh, you know, they just, uh, how do we know? I mean, I will give examples. Sometimes I don't. But for all our data that we have, it, they do exist. And I'll give you intuitions for, I will, I will give you some natural data distributions where you can see. Uh, that they, it depends, of course, it depends on the classifier and so on. I mean, presumably you can make a simple classifier where these don't exist, but uh, they do exist because of the data of our data, basically. Um, anyway, so it's interesting to read the literature because people were quite naive in the beginning. So, you know, 2013, pigs can fly, great. And then people try to explain it. Why? Right? It took actually many years, if I think about the progress, it took at least three, four years until people built the right intuition as to, or right, or some intuition as to why that stuff actually exists and why, what's happening here. Um, so the first uh, kind of naive paper um, is good for, I mean, I don't want to call it naive, but I mean, the first one that actually tried to understand what's happening, it's Goodfellow et al. in 2015, sorry. And he was like saying, okay, what's actually happening? Clearly, he says, this is something because we are in high dimension, that's why it's happened. Okay, so naive, it's somewhat naive. But what he says, let's just look at the linear classifier, linear classifier where f of x is simply this, right? So here's our linear classifier. And now let's perturb the, the classifier. So let's perturb x. So what would the classifier do? If we perturb x to x tilde a little bit, then the classifier clearly now says this, right? Sorry, uh, let's say this is x plus delta in our notation, right? So this would happen here, right? So what would the classifier, let's, you know what? People also often call it eta. So allow me to call it eta so that I don't copy it wrong. So we find some perturbation here. And, uh, you know, obviously what is happening, he says, um, the best thing to do for such a thing is to maximally screw this classifier, what would you do? You would set it to some epsilon, which is the allowed distance, times the sine of w, right? Sine, I mean, point-wise, right? So if you do this, then what happens? Um, then, uh, then what happens to the output? So every, every little piece here gets uh, disturbed by, is it minus sine of w? Let me just make it right. Uh, maybe it's minus sine of W. So what we do is we try to align our perturbation in the direction of the classifier except the opposite direction to make it say the wrong thing. And because every entry, let's say it's L-infinity norm, every entry has a constant contribution. Let's assume our classifier is order one, right? So let's assume the entries of W are something like order one, just for intuition, right? So every little perturbation here, if we are in XD, we'll get a perturbation so the perturbation, the, the order of magnitude of this perturbation, right, will be order, order d, even with small constant changes. I mean, this is just nothing. I mean, I'm just counting. I'm looking what happens. If you perturb every coordinate by 0 0.01 and you have d of them, then, of course, the whole perturbation is huge. So he just said, oh, it's a phenomenon of high dimensions. And uh, the best way to find adversarial examples is just simply to go in the other direction of the classifier. Okay, so this sounds naive, but it led to the first um, kind of way of generating adversarial examples, which is still used today for benchmarking. It's called FGSM, um, fast gradient sign method.
So they proposed this FGSM. This is 2050. FGSM is simply so fast gradient sign method is simply to find an adversarial perturbation, right, by making it epsilon or minus epsilon times the sign, right, sign of the loss function for a neural net in the usual parameterization, right? Okay, so in analogy to what I just did here, that I just point in the direction of the classifier, which is just, you know, if you write it down, is just the gradient for, say, L2 loss. Here, in more generality, I look at what the neural net does. I take the gradient, so where it's worse, right? Where, where the most change to the loss function happens. And then I take that gradient and just take all the signs of that gradient because I, you know, I want to be a maximum L infinity norm and this is the budget I have in my L infinity norm to perturb things. Clear, right? So that, that is the FGSM method of generating adversarial examples. And it, you know, it worked quite well, but <laughs> there was a limit because it's, it's still somewhat naive. And so people um, thought about it a little better and then the kind of the most, more or less state-of-the-art method of generating adversarial examples came in, um, you know, was proposed by two papers, Kurakin et al. in 2017, ICLR 17, and also uh, Madri et al. Madri et al. in 18, uh, also ICLR, if that helps. And they came up with a slightly more um, sophisticated method, which is called PGD, projected gradient descent, which just tries to, you know, optimize a little bit better to find adversarial examples. So what they do is, in, instead of just doing one step of gradient descent on the loss function, they do multiple and project back into their epsilon ball. So let me just write it down they do the following xt plus 1. So they do several steps of gradient descent on x, right? So they project uh, into the epsilon ball around x. Uh, let's, let's put it, uh, let, let me write it in a second. So here's a gradient step. Here's a kind of a step size. And again, the sign, as we have seen, of the gradient with respect to xt of the loss function, how do I write it, L, of the loss function of theta xt. Why? xt is how we move in this example space. So we want to project xt plus 1, we want to project it on a ball, epsilon ball, around x. Uh, x0, I presume. Nikos is x0, xt. I keep forgetting, but I think it's x0. So we want to stay within our L infinity of the original of the original sample. And then we move in gradients and we move with gradient steps of some small step size. Alpha is usually something like if you're anyway projecting, do you need to take sign or can you just do it like alpha times gradient? So they, yeah, that's a good question. They do use the sign. I think they want to each time optimize their budget in L infinity norm somehow. Yeah. Again, I mean, we're getting into the somewhat heuristic um, area here, right? But you see what is happening. Um, so instead of just doing the sign thing once, um, you allow yourself several steps. Each time you perturb your gradient, excuse me, you perturb your loss function as badly as you can. You might walk out of your epsilon ball. So you project back into your epsilon ball. You update, I mean, you update your x, right? You start with some point. You do this gradient walk, you walk a little bit, in case you went outside of your permitted budget, you project yourself back into this epsilon ball around the original, because that's where you want to stay, and you do several steps like this. And this is actually state-of-the-art attacks, one of, of the state-of-the-art attacks against, um, against uh, deep learning models. Is that clear? Yes. Yes, it's just element-wise, plus-minus, right? I mean, you just literally produces the plus-minus vector. Let me just say um, for, so alpha is usually, uh, it's a small step size. 
Um, for and, and it's uh, you know people have converged the community. I mean, there's tons and tons of paper in this area, right? I mean, hundreds every year. So the community has converged on some values for alpha. Uh, so the values are independent of no, let me, okay, so usually, okay, epsilon, there is some sort of consensus what epsilons are interesting, okay? So epsilon for MNIST is 0 0.3. Now don't ask why, um, but it's basically something where you know that you can completely screw up a normal uh, deep learning system. So take any neural net for MNIST, allow yourself this budget in L infinity perturbation, and you will make the classifier be always wrong. This is literally a number, but MNIST, we, we assume this is scaled between minus one and one, every pixel. So this is a pretty big perturbation. That's a big one, yeah. Yes, yes. For MNIST, this is big, but MNIST is a pretty robust data set. And why is that so? Because MNIST, if you look at it, it's pretty binary. So there's very little gray in MNIST. It's mainly either black or white. So the values are either one or minus one. Mostly, okay? So it actually takes, MNIST is not a good example to study robustness, basically. It takes quite a lot of effort to screw up MNIST because it's kind of binary, right? I mean, okay, so MNIST is, uh, don't think of MNIST as your prime example. For CIFAR, um, Boas, you'll be much happier. Uh, it's 8 over 255 in some normalized way, again, between, if it's uh, between 0 and 1. And then the corresponding alpha, as I said, is 0 0.01 for MNIST, and for CIFAR, the alpha is, what is it? Um, 2 over 255. And honestly, don't ask me why it's uh, 255, because I don't know, but there is some that's reasoning. Like the, that's the intensity ah, that's okay, that's the, they're great. Okay, so that's their scale, and in that scale, we move two units, which is small, right? I mean, this is like a percent or so. All right. Ah, yes, and how many times to iterate? So for MNIST, people usually do PGD 20. And when they want to be really sophisticated, they do PGD 40, 40 steps, okay? Roughly, this is kind of, again, if Nikos is here, I don't know where he is, but he is my reference on all these things. Did he run away? Anyway, so this is roughly, sometimes people go a little further, but that's basically enough to, uh, to get everything that you want. Yeah, for CIFAR, it's PGD 40, yes, usually. And also for ImageNet, I mean, people, that, that seems to be enough. Empirically. Okay, so this is empirics. Again, we, this is not so interesting. But now let me give you an intuition of why this all happens, uh, which I liked a lot. Um, so uh, why is this a hard problem? Uh, and then people, so then historically what happened is that people started creating defenses. So first they, they were interested in creating attacks. I mean, making this a little more scientific. And then of course, immediately, uh, they started creating defenses. And it's the, 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 the area, the, the field, is still a little bit like uh, applied cryptography. So I, I'm not such a big fan of applied cryptography because the way it works is that there's a group and they work really hard and they come up with a new defense. And then the, all the other groups sit down and work really, really hard and they come with a new attack. And so you know it's this cat and mouse game in that community. And a little bit this is also what happens or happened, maybe it's a little less so now, in this community, right? Attack, defense, attack, defense. So, but the state-of-the-art defense, state-of-the-art defense is what is called adversarial training. So maybe I'll tell you what is adversarial training, and then we do a sample complexity separation. Yes? Not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge. There is, th this I don't know, th I know there is work that tries to understand which architecture is more robust than others. And it seems, okay, again, Nikos, you are my, my arbiter here, but I think convolutional networks are a little less robust than fully connected ones, is this true? Yes, so it's, I, I always mix this up. So convolutional ones are a bit more weak, and presumably because, you know, points are closer to the margin or something like this, the boundaries are a bit narrower in convolutional networks, but, uh, but I don't know of any result about pruning. I have to say. Okay, so not to my knowledge. Um, but in general, we don't have, uh, uh, at least the last time I, I, I remember hearing about it, we, there is a huge gap between uh, the accuracy we know how to achieve. Yeah, let me speak about this. There's a huge, I mean, it's hor I, will, I will give you, I will, yes, I will tell you in what abysmal state this field is in a second. Yes, I, I'll have some slides on that. But first, let me tell you what people do. So there were lots of defenses and uh, then lots of breaks and defense and breaks. I mean, there were eight years to defend and to break. But the state of the art, more or less, is what's called adversarial training, AT. 
uh, which comes, I mean, was, I guess it's a natural idea, but it's often attributed to Madri et al. 18. Okay. I presume this is not, uh, you know, that this is an obvious idea that in various guises perhaps appeared around this time uh, in various groups. But what do you do? Okay. Uh, you do what's called robust training. Robust training. Because you, you do exactly what you want to do if you write this down. I already tried this here with the kit, but let me write it down as a saddle point problem, right? So basically that means to solve a saddle point problem. And when I solve, it's always, it's always approximately, because you can never really solve it, at least not in these highly non-convex situations, OK? So what they want to solve is now we are training a neural network. So we are minimizing all the parameters. That's what we do when we train. What we want to do is we want to be good in expectation over our data, right? And then, because we want to do it robustly, we want to take the epsilon ball around x with our metric, whatever, L infinity, and then some loss, usually cross entropy loss, uh, this is the problem we want to solve, right? We want to find a neural net, we want to optimize the parameters such that with the worst possible loss, excuse me, with the worst possible example with respect to the loss, we are still classifying well. Right? Is that clear that this is the problem? This is the abstract min-max problem that comes from this whole adversarial, this is a robust, convex, a robust optimization, which has been also studied way before adversarial robustness, right? And so what do these people do? They do it in a game theoretic way. I mean, they try to, you know, uh, they, they solve this min-max problem by having first an inner loop during training, inner loop. In the inner loop, they, um, they um, optimize delta. They change the training data, OK? So in the inner loop, what they do is they do PGD, PGD, just like I showed you, to find the best x, right, to screw up the loss. So they do the PGD step. And then they have an outer loop, right, where they, they do this PGD on the training data, I should say, on training on the training data batch. This is all during training, right? So we take the training data, we do a PGD step on it, on our batch, whatever batch size we have. We mess it up as much as we can, then we feed it into the neural net, so we've done this step, and then we minimize the weights. So the outer loop is simply use SGD on that screwed up data, right? So that's what people do. I mean, this is the state of the art to produce robust models more or less, with some variations. So, so just so I'm, I'm clear, they are not doing auto-differentiating on PTD, rather they are... No, 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 that's way too complicated. Um, no, they really just brute force. First, you do 40 steps or 20 steps, depending, to mess up your data. Then you use it to train your network. You optimize your parameter towards this messed up thing. And you restart from now from that slightly the net has slightly learned something from slightly robust data and then, I mean, slightly adversarial data, and you continue. Minimization, like you have these steps, like first you have this theta t, then you, you adversarially attack this particular theta t, then you, you learn theta t plus one, and then you adversarially yeah. attack this theta t. So this is for each step you get a new theta t, as you said, right? And you attack this one in the next step here, right? So, right? so you have an alternation of theta update X update, theta update, X, I mean, adversarial perturbation update, I should say. Okay, is that clear? That's state of the art. It's pretty ugly, yes? Do it from the initialization of the network, or they can first use... No, no, so they initialize their neural net with theta zero, yeah. right? They start with clean data, okay. right? With like a batch of training data. And then they mess up the data, and then the first gradient update on the theta is already on the messed up data. Even other 
beginning. Yes, yes, they do it. Uh, again, there are, there are millions of papers that try variations where they say maybe the beginning doesn't matter, maybe we first train a bit and then do this. But this vanilla version starts honestly one step like this, one step like that, one step like this, so alternate, min-max. If, if you just try it normally and have a number of us the model, and can you then apply these? So if you first train it normally, and then mess it up, the thing completely fails. That's how these epsilon and uh, parameters are chosen. Basically, if you train a CIFAR normally, and then at the end, mess up the test data with this epsilon, you'll have zero accuracy. Right? This is really enough to mess up everything, with just PGD steps with this, with this uh, epsilon at the end. So you must do it during training. I mean, yes. Okay, and I mean, there are all kinds of experiments. People try to also just train it normally, then mess up the data in the end, train it on that one. It all doesn't work as well as doing it in this min-max fashion, which makes sense. I mean, it's just trying to approximate the settle, settle point problem. All right, so what's the problem with this thing? I mean, it's awfully messy, as you can see. But one problem is it's much more data hungry. So in other words, if you normally uh, need some data to train your network to convergence. In order to train this one, you need much more data in general and much more time. So it's really, I mean, it's great. It kind of works. It doesn't, I mean, you know, you get something like 60% accuracy on CIFAR with this in the best version. So it's not great. It's the best thing with all the bells and whistles is still very far from a good performance on CIFAR. Um, but apart from that, it takes forever. I mean, it's really a terrible situation. I mean, you have to understand this is really an open problem and a uh, whole community. Anyway, so you, you, you realize this. So let me give you now, because we want to do some, get some intuition, let me give you um, an... Uh, yes? Sorry, maybe you already said that and, and just being stupid. You do the max there. So you're doing that, you, you have one delta bed data point, like it's inside the, the expectation. So for each data point that you have, you need to find the max Yes, but you do it in batches, just like you do a, a gradient. Is, I mean, you do it on the whole batch. I mean, everyone gets his own delta. Yes. Yes, you get everybody, every data point gets their own delta. That is true, if that's what you were asking. It's not one delta for all of them in that batch. Right. All right, now let me actually finally give you some intuition. Um, this is a, a very nice uh, uh, separation. I find it nice. In uh, sample complexity. Uh, yes, please. This is like supervised learning. So it's assuming, this is, this is a heuristic, that the epsilon is small enough that at the end of the day, the y has not been affected. Like if I take MNIST, for example, I could perfectly imagine that I make attacks, which is that the 1 becomes a 7. And in fact, it's not really an adversarial attack anymore. In the data set, you should have classified it differently. Um, are you saying there must be a bound on epsilon? I mean, yes. clearly this thing will fail as epsilon, epsilon is one or something. Yes, yes. I mean, there is there is a limit to when this will work. This is an infinity norm. So if you think about like uh, say, if you think about like saying C for uh, eight over two fifty five, so you basically have an RGB value and every pixel is changed by All right. Uh, yes. Can you the accuracy of the original training set? Does it like it's it's destroyed or? Yeah, that's that's the robot. I will give you if you allow me. But yes, it gets worse. So. First of all, this is a good point. You train on this thing, so what you're training on is be good on the robust. You're, you're training yourself to be good on every perturbation, and you can ask rightly, how do you do on the, actually, the clean image? Maybe there is no adversary after this training. So that will go down too, usually, in general. So you will not, even on clean stuff, you will be worse than a normal classifier, in general. And I'll give you another intuition on that one. It's beautiful, uh, just examples where you can see this very clearly. Okay, but that's a good question. And also, one more thing about this thing. Um, when you train like this, uh, we are used now with neural nets, we are kind of used with our classifiers that they, we tr if we train them enough, then they will generalize well. 
with neural nets, right? We train them, we have good accuracy, we get the same accuracy on the test set, usually. Here, there's also a much bigger gap. Even if the test set comes from the same robust distribution, so even if the test set is the test set with robust perturbations, the generalization is much, much worse. Right? You can train the thing to training robust accuracy 100%, or close to 100%, and still be pretty bad uh, on, on the real test set. So there is also a generalization gap here, which people don't really understand very well. There's really beautiful problems here for, for all those people who like to work on this. All right. Um, but let me now give you an intuition, finally. And intuitions always come from Gaussians, as you know. So let's assume a uh, definition. We have a Gaussian. OK. We are in RD. Let me define this. Define what is this. This is a, a theta sigma Gaussian distribution. So what does it mean? Uh, we have x, y in Rd. Uh, it's a binary classifier, so it's a binary, sorry, binary labels, right? And the way we generate this distribution is first we pick a y. We pick a y randomly from plus minus one, okay? And then uh, we pick an x as a normal of y theta star, right? And sigma squared for some sigma identity in, uh, what did I, did I use? Dimension D, okay? All right, so what are we doing here? We're taking a Gaussian distribution and we have two labels and we have a direction. This is a vector in RD. So we have some hidden, uh, as Boas would call it, what would you call it? Um, hidden, we plant something, uh, whatever it is. I mean, we don't know what we have planted, some direction in space, okay? Uh, and think of roughly, just for intuition, this is not a part of the definition, but for intuition, roughly the norm of this thing, we're thinking it of square root of d, right? So roughly, okay? Uh, anyway, so we're having some direction in space, okay? And our samples are of one of two types. Either we kind of align with this direction, right? This is our mean. We align with this direction and we perturb it a little bit in each coordinate. Or we align with the opposite direction, okay? And that's our data set. Clear? Right, so beautiful data set. And uh, we're looking at, let's look at L infinity perturbation for our, so for our epsilon, we look at L infinity here of x, right? So basically these are Right, so just, just to fix the team here, we want to be precise for once, right? Okay, and uh, what I will, I will tune, so here the only really tunable parameter is this sigma, sigma squared, right? So how much noise do we allow in each coordinate? And we want to distinguish these two directions, right? And we get samples that are noisy. Samples, they're pointing right, but then they're noisy. All right, so statement, we tune the sigma. So this, you can tune the sigma and get all kinds of separations, but for the benefit of, of this one, we want to tune the sigma to be uh, sigma, we'll say, is roughly as a constant, let's even make it precise, a constant times d to the one quarter, okay? And again, this is a parameter, but let's set it like, and I set it this way, because if I set it this way, then in order to robustly, uh, excuse me, in order to have a classifier for the problem without robustness, just classifier, only one sample. I need only one sample to learn to learn uh, a classifier, if you wish. Okay, that's a simple separation, but I need at least, uh, uh, let me just write it down properly. How many samples do I need to learn it robustly? I need at least, uh, it's either d or square root of d. Um, d. I need at least d samples to learn, to learn, uh, let's say, epsilon, a robust classifier, epsilon, say, 0 0.01 uh, robust. And this is just a number. I can make it any number. But I want to say it's a constant, OK? Robust classifier. So what am I saying here? I'm saying if there's no adversary, no L infinity adversary, then I just need one sample. I need one sample and I can generalize, 
Okay? But if I have an adversary, I can try as hard as I want. I need at least these samples in order to generalize. Is the statement clear? Is the statement clear? Yes, okay. So let's start with a simple piece. Can you tell me what would be, so how do I construct a classifier, forget the adversary, with one sample? I mean, I get my sample, what do I do? I mean, I have not much choice, I get a sample. Uh, and the sample says, what does it say? Um, right, so the proof, let's, how do I, okay, maybe I should, I should let you think for a second. How would you do it with one sample? You get the sample, it points kind of in the right direction, but not quite. So what would you do? How would you construct a classifier? Sorry, yes. Right, right, right. So let me translate Lenka into the language of a linear classifier. So what Lenka just said is what Lenka just said is she said construct a linear classifier. When you get your sample, here's my sample, it comes along. This is my sample. And then we construct a linear classifier F W of X equal w transpose times x, right? And how do we class, uh, construct it? By taking w equal uh, s the uh, sine, what were I doing? Uh, the classifier, excuse me. So, and the classifier for any x, sorry, this is not good, um, wx of x, I'm sorry. So this will be the classifier on all other data points, but how do we construct Wx? We simply set it as uh, uh, pointing in the direction of y times x, y times this x, okay? So in other words, if the label is 1, we point in the x that we got, and if the label is minus 1, we decide to change directions. And then in order to classify new points, we just measure the inner product with the one we have just found. Yes, I should take a sign. Uh, sign. Okay, I'm sorry to confuse you. So it, it, I wrote down what I wanted to say in words. The point comes, we just accept it as the classifier. We flip it sign if necessary, if it was a minus label, and that will be our direction, and that will be our approximation for this theta. So we basically, we take y, x, as, if this is the sample we get, we take it as an approximation for this thing, right? And we guess this is the right, right direction, okay? So now let me give you an intuition quickly. Why would this work? I mean, we have all this noise, but it's not really a problem, this noise. And this is, I'm, I'm just being now intuitive, right? My proofs are by intuition. First of all, everything is Gaussian, which means I can rotate it into any basis I like, right? That's the beauty of Gaussians. So I can assume that my theta star is simply, I said it's norm square root d. Um, it looks like this. Let's assume, right? I, I put myself on a convenient basis, and I just say that it points in the first coordinate, right? So that's, this is my theta star, and what are the samples I get? So the x's I get, let's say they are pointing if the y label is 1, right? Or I should say y times x, will kind of point in this direction, but not quite. It will look like this. It will have this, and then it will have these little normals here. 0, d to the 1 quarter, right? And then I'll have a... No, uh, I mean, I'm writing this informally, but each one has a little fluctuation of size d to the one quarter, right? And the dimension here is d, okay? Okay, and now another sample comes with the same noise, but of course, if I take an inner product, right? What's the inner product of the noisy sample with theta? The inner product is simply, uh, you know, you, you get all these fluctuations, they're either plus or minus, right? So if you add them up, you basically, the inner product of whatever you got here with this theta star, and I'm being vague here, is, is, is roughly um, all these things here. So that is d to the one quarter, right, times square root of d. Oh, times d to the one quarter, right? And there's square, I mean, square root of d comes because there are d of them. Okay, so each one has length d to the one quarter, and there's square root of d of them, and of course I had my constant here, c squared, and let's make it small enough su such that the inner product, right, the inner product will be here of order square root, I said plus, plus the d here, and the d comes from the first component, 
right? So in the first component, square root of d times square root of d gives me a d. That's all fine. And then the other components, at most, can screw me up by this much. But if I set my c small enough, then there's no way I can flip the sign with all these Gaussian perturbations. OK? Right? So far, so good. So that's, that's kind of uh, the upper bound. And now, why can an adversary screw me up unless I have enough samples? OK? So the thing is that uh, now comes the adversarial robustness, right? So now there is somebody who, in each, in each component of my vector, is allowed to apply a constant change to each coordinate, OK? In L infinity norm. So each coordinate can be changed. Unfortunately, I cannot rotate myself anymore into this basis because the adversary is an L infinity norm, and L infinity norm you can't rotate. I mean, it's not invariant under rotation. So, so now, um, let me just, uh, for the, the intuition here, I said this is roughly this. What people use for the proof is that they actually, this thing will come from a normal distribution, 0, 1, d. Okay, so um, for the proof, we need to assume that, uh, that this, uh, this direction is basically also random Gaussian. But it has, it has norm square root d in this, in this, in this kind of, uh, the norm of, of, of you know, a d-dimensional Gaussian with constant uh, thing is square root d. Okay, so now what happens if you, what is the probability that you misclassify um, if you, Unless you have en enough samples, what will happen is the question, right? So what can the adversary do? So uh, let, me just, uh, let me just give an intuition for the lower bound. So for the lower bound, intuition. The intuition is that we still build a linear classifier, OK? So now we get samples. We get several samples, and we build a linear classifier, right? OK? So in particular, Let's assume we just get one sample. And now, again, I can't rotate. So this theta star is, is, has plus minus 1 roughly in each coordinate, right? So the sample that I'm getting, if I get only one sample, how would it look like? It would, would be this theta star, right? And then it would have all these little, little d to the 1 quarters here. Right? OK? So this is the sample I'm getting, plus minus. Right? So now, what can an adversary do to screw me up? If I build the linear classifier uh, in this way, right? If I, if I take my sample to be the linear classifier, how would the adversary screw me up? All the adversary has to do is basically flip Right, if this is my linear classifier, all the adversary has to do is flip the signs here enough. And the adversary has constant, right? He can, he can flip each thing by epsilon. So you can see easily that the adversary can screw you up by just flipping the inner product. OK, but let's, let's make this precise. Let's just, uh, um, let's just write it down. Um, our classifier, let's assume you get n samples. OK, so this was just for one sample. Let's assume you, you allowed n samples. And you build a linear classifier. So what would you do? You would build a linear classifier by writing the, taking the average, right? You would take the average of all the data points that you're getting by flipping them first, right? So each time you get data pointing in the right direction, I mean, you first unflip it. And then you just average these data points in order to get a linear classifier. And, and the proof is, of course, general. The proof just takes any classifier and looks at the two Gaussian distributions and sees that they are too close for an adversary to flip. But let's just stay linear. So the best thing with a linear classifier you would do is you get all these vectors. They're all kind of pointing in this direction, roughly. You would just average them. Okay? And if you do so, what would you get? You would get a vector that is kind of intuitively, it would be pointing in this theta direction. And then all these normal fluctuations, the d to the 1 quarter fluctuations, because you have n samples, they would, uh, they would tone down, right? Because then you would get just normal, let me just write it like this, a normal that is d to the 1 quarter divided by square root n, right? 
uh, right? So each, each fluctuation, which was before d to the 1 quarter. Yes, sorry, you take the average. Yes, I should say that. Absolutely. YI, sorry. Right, so that's what would happen. You would get these uh, fluctuations that would, uh, so sigma, so this was sigma, I should say sigma squared. So d to the 1 half, so this is the sigma squared when you take samples where each individual sigma squared is d to the 1 half, right? So I wrote down sigma here, where's sigma? Sigma is of order d to the 1 quarter. Sigma squared is d to the 1 half. And then the sigma squared, when you average all these, goes with d to the 1 half over square root n. n is just the number of data points I've got. And then I'll show that n has to be of order d for this to work. No, I think, I think if you, uh, over square root n is the standard deviation, but uh, if ah, the n, n, here, n, 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 right, n. OK. All right, OK. And it might be that our sample separation is only square root d, actually, now that you say this. Yes, square root d. OK, so what did I say? Square root d, sorry. I apologize. You need a square root d number of samples to separate. And that's because, sorry, because you want to cancel this out. You want this to be constant, OK, at least. OK, so let's see. So now. We got a pretty exact, so we wanted to shoot in one direction. We each time had a bit of, uh, you know, we, we shot not quite that direction. But if we repeat it n time, then we're pretty exact. And each component will only have um, d to the 1 half over n uh, deviation, right? So let's call this the kind of the, this is the noise vector. That's the noise vector that we get in our estimate. And then um, there's also an adversarial vector, right? So then the adversary can come and apply a perturbation with infinity norm bound by epsilon, right? Some small epsilon, some constant, OK? Right? And so now the question is, what's the probability that we misclassify? OK, so I have all these in one direction. I kind of concentrate them, so they're pointing more sharply in this direction. And now comes a new sample. What's the probability that I misclassify it if the adversary is allowed on the new sample to apply this noise, right? You with me? OK, so let's compute it, because that's now not so hard to see, because this is just you know, adding these, looking at these fluctuations. So a test point comes along, right? A new point from the data set that I want to classify. And it basically looks like a data point, but has this adversarial error and comes with a label. Uh, it looks like a, how can I say? So you, you get a test point, which is from the distribution, but has this adversarial perturbation, OK? And you want to and you want to properly classify it, which means you want that, uh, uh, so let's assume y is 1. I don't want to multiply with y. But you want to you make sure it points in the right direction, right, with respect to your classifier. So what do you do? Um, you just compute inner products. Basically, we want to see that the inner product is still positive. So um, how do we classify this thing? So we get our, our estimator, we said, is theta plus noise, right? So this is our, this is our estimator, set the star plus the noise vector, right? And we want to take the inner product with our test point, uh, which is from the distribution and has this adversarial perturbation, right? And we are asking, we want, so I, I'm assuming now y is 1. So we first flip the sign. And we want to have it classified that should point in the same direction, right? So we are asking, when is, it, uh, when is it misclassified? So if this is smaller than 0, then we misclassify, right? You with me? OK. And so the noise vector, we have, we've seen what norm it has. Uh, we know that. Uh, these vectors all have norm square root of d, roughly. So let's just do the calculation to see what n has to be for this to work. So this would be theta x, which is roughly of order d, right? This is just uh, basically of them, th these two pointing in the right direction. Um, I, I'm kind of glossing over the fact that x also has some noise, because we already showed in the, in the correct case that we can deal with that noise, OK? So we have this order d. Then we have noise 
x, which we have seen from this one example here, that this is fine as long as, uh, you know, if, if d is one quarter, then this is, um, this will be d to the one quarter divided by square root n times square root d, roughly. This is order of magnitude, right? Then we have this term. So these are the good terms. Um, then we have this term here, which is n and uh, theta. Well, let me just write first the good terms. And then, so this is the good term. This is the one that points in the right direction. This is some noise, but it's kind of fine because it's not large enough. Um, then we have, how do I put this? Theta star, let's do it this way, theta star and uh, delta. And then we have the noise with delta, right? And we want it to be negative, so we need to. So this, this, this one, there's this one is, is well behaved. It's small enough that it can't beat the d, no matter what, right? So this is always plus minus here, right? I mean, this term is also fine because theta star has. Um, so this one here goes as. Um, where is this? This is roughly epsilon times square root d in norm, right? Because the adversary has constant in every, in every component. Uh, this one here is a Gaussian 0, 1. So it's of order d, right? But this one here is the problematic one. Because now the adversary, what he should be doing is align, align himself with this noise vector, right? So if the adversary aligns himself with the noise vector, right, then what happens? Then we get here epsilon times d times d to the 1 quarter divided by square root n, right? You with me? Because these are all constant, and these are all d to the 1 quarter, and now he has aligned himself nastily. So we get a d and not a square root d, okay? And then you can see now that unless, unless n is larger than square root of d, the adversary simply picks the sign of the noise and makes it such that he can flip the sign of the whole thing. Okay? Is that clear? Yes, okay, seems clear to most people. You can find the third term. Why is the third term okay? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Let's see, why is it okay? Um, well, the short answer is because it's epsilon square root of d, but uh, this is just because it's a, it's a Gaussian zero one. Right? And this one is constant, so this will basically go epsilon square root of d. Right. Isn't that like the L2 norm? I mean, you only have an L infinity bound on delta. Yes, but I'm now, I haven't rotated myself, right? I kept, I stayed in the, ba I, that's, pre that's why I didn't do this rotation. I stayed in the basis um, where the adversary is L infinity, right? Can the adversary adapt to theta star? Uh, can the adversary adapt to theta star? Let's see. So you want here, you want a, uh, you want a d, uh, let's see. It's still okay, so maybe maybe we can, I don't want to, yes, let me let me think about it. I, I, I think I convinced myself it's a square root. Of course, this is not the proof in the paper, right? I'm just, I'm not, I'm a bit lazy, so I don't like to, to read proofs. I like to kind of get my intuition. I convinced myself it was square root d, but uh, even if it's d, uh, you agree that if epsilon is 0 0.1, so, yeah. then, then it's fine, right? Um, but I have to think about it also, yeah. Yes, here, that is very good. Yes, this is a good uh, observation. This, here, we really tailored the proof to the L infinity norm. We did. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then it won't work. Yes, very good. Um, but of course, this is just, I'm trying to give you some intuition why the adversary can screw things up, right? And mind you, one important observation is that the noise here has a large scale. D to the one quarter is, is not so small, right? I mean, if D is large. So the noise can be quite, there can be quite a lot of noise on your data, and it's still fine. 
But the moment the adversary can mess with the science, right? Even with a little bit of noise in L infinity, he can screw you up. Or she. Actually, like in this example, so if you were to say, so you could make theta star b say plus minus one, that would have the same noise. And then uh, if you made the ball be, uh, say, of radius uh, two, which is still like a small fraction of the magnitude of the entries, then suddenly from being able to do it in this, uh, you know, like in one sample, you, you, you become to being unable to do it even in an infinite number of samples, right? Because you could just shift from theta star to minus theta star. Uh, but not under this model, right? I mean, what's your data model then? So I'm saying that you know, you, you, your mean is either like, the, the difference between the means in L infinity norm is just uh, two. Yes. Between the positive points and the negative points. If you make th this one here norm one. No, norm, norm no. uh, infinity norm one, but plus one is Ah, one yeah. Oh, two. so you are now saying. So I'm saying that the, yeah. the two means are very, uh, compared to the magnitude of the vectors that you observe, to the data that you observe, the two means are actually close in L infinity norm. That is true. That is true. Yes. Uh, but I'm not sure, I have to think if it really leads to an, it, I don't think it leads to an infinite sample complexity separation. Yeah, I, I have to think this through. But, uh, um, so, but just to give you an intuition how an L, L infinity adversary can screw you up, even if you are tolerating noise that is much larger. And this is what people observe when they do uh, classification on CIFAR. You can add a bit of Gaussian noise to every pixel, it's fine, right? Um, but if you add adversarial noise, you are in trouble. And the same is true, I mean, yesterday I spoke a little bit about low dimensional manifold where the data lies. And there, there are some papers trying to analyze the situation if there is a low dimensional manifold sitting embedded in a big one that gives a lot of ways for the decision boundary to be screwed up if an adversary really tries. I mean, I don't, you know, there's, there's nice geometric papers if you like that kind of stuff that try to, you know, give an explanation of why the adversary has this effect, okay? Um, and let me just say, recently there have been a few more separations, um, mainly by Bubeck uh, and Bubeck and Selke, who also relate this to uh, hardness, so the SQ model hardness or cryptographic hardness, modular cryptography, where they show that you know ro robust classification is computationally hard. These are, I mean, these are heavyweight papers, but, but you know there are all kinds of separations. Uh, in that in that area, and there's a recent paper by Bubek and Selke, which I'm still digesting, but I think Boris has maybe better digested, where they show that um, robust classification, um, if you have a neural net with some good Lipschitz condition, I mean, if you if your neural net is mildly Lipschitz, and you do want to do robust classification, um, then just training it, just training it robust, they call it the law of robustness, just training it. Um, in the number of, requires a Lipschitz constant that scales, that it requires a lot of parameters, basically, because the Lipschitz number of that neural net must scale inversely with the number of parameters. Did I say this roughly right? It, it's, 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 I mean, there's lots of these very nice separations um, that make you understand, uh, depending on where you're coming from culturally, uh, what, you know, where, where this is all coming from. All right, so I wanted to give you uh, an into, I don't know what, how much do I have? 10 minutes? 15 minutes? I did start. So 10, 10, 12? Yes. Okay, so because I want to keep something, I mean, there's some nice things that I want to say precisely. Um, so maybe I, give me just a second. Um, yeah, so maybe I, let me speak about one way that people, no, let me, I know what I'll do. Let me speak about, um, something that you have already asked me, and that is the trade-off between accuracy and robustness. Okay, so um, just one more remark. Um, wh when I spoke about this Bubeck and Selke results, so one more observation people make is A, adversarial training is very data hungry. So it needs much more data, much more training, much more samples, and we have seen some reason why this is true. Uh, the other thing is it's also more parameter hungry, and this is more the Bubeck and Selke type of results. In other words, if the model has low capacity, not so many parameters, 
it's much harder to make it robust, if, if, if not impossible. So uh, higher capacity models, basically there's also empirical work on this by the Madri group, that a large model capacity allows for more robustness. Right? So there's a trade-off also with number of parameters here. Okay? So, but uh, that aside, there is this interesting observation between robustness and accuracy. Namely, there's a trade-off. So what people observe routinely is that when you have a good classifier, you can get a very nice 99% on MNIST or 95 or 6, whatever, on CIFAR. The moment you train it robustly, it suffers even in normal accuracy on the test set, quite a bit. Okay? So if you want to be robust, you're suddenly less accurate on the test, on the standard accuracy. Okay? So that's, that's just an empirical observation, and that's annoying also, right? You want a good classifier, you want it also to be robust as a bonus, but you don't want to pay in accuracy. But it seems to be inevitable. And le let me give you, because that led to a beautiful series of works that also have nice images associated, but let me give you an intuition why there is a trade-off um, for this. And one beautiful example, I took it from a paper by the Madri group. Um, it's a paper by... Let me just find the paper here. What is this? This is, uh, I think it's ICLR19, but in any case, it's 2019. Um, let's look at the following distribution, right? So let's look at the distribution of data. Um, X is an RD, as always. Y is a label, and we generate the data in the following way. First, we flip, as always, we flip our Y, right, our label, and then here's our vector. Oh, let me make this RD plus 1. I think it will be easier. And the first component will be called X0, XD, okay? So here's what we do. We set X0 to be equal to y with probability 95%, okay? And otherwise, we set it to minus y, otherwise, okay? So we take the first feature in that vector and we highly correlate it with the label, but only 95%. Maybe, you know what, to make it more dramatic, let me make it 90, okay, 90, okay? So we correlate it well, but not that well. 90%, good. And then what do we do with the other coordinates? The other coordinates, x1 up to xd, we take them from a Gaussian. And now let me not screw it up, from a Gaussian. And now here we have a mean and, and a variance. So the mean is y times 10 square root of d1. All right, so what are we doing? We're taking this vector, the first feature, we kind of align with the label. So, so just to understand, like, uh, you're saying it's the constant vector, the mean, the mean is like the, this is multiplied by the all vectors one, what, the mean should be a vector. Uh, oh, each, one them, or, uh, each one is, uh, the mean is this, yeah, so how do you want this written as one? One, one, one? I don't know how you want it. Or we could say every co x, so each coordinate, let's make it coordinate by coordinate, right? So this is just a one, okay? So each coordinate, I have variance one, but my mean is kind of weakly pointing into the direction of the label. It's either plus or minus, but it's tiny. Okay, so if you look at each coordinate, it's kind of weakly, but very weakly aligned with the label. I mean, honestly, if I was to classify this thing, I would first look at the, first coordinate, sorry, at the first coordinate, right? I would look at it and I would say, okay, 90%, I already got it right, right? Okay, but we have D of those. So what would you, what is the best classifier here? Let's think, uh, forget robustness for a second. Let's just see how would I classify this thing? No adversary, nothing. What would I do? Okay, one option is to say, okay, I'm just gonna look at the first coordinate, that's it, 90% right. But can I do better, is the question. What would I do? 
Right, so I mean my classifier, no, sorry, weighted average, yes, so, okay, let me write it. Boris remark, I translated into a linear classifier, hopefully better than linker. So I would build a classifier, W, F of X equal WX, as always, right? And my W would be the first coordinate I ignore, actually. Let's draw it out. And all the others would be one, right? So that's my linear classifier. What does it do? It takes all these coordinates in the end, all the D ones, and oh, let's do an average, so let's do one over D, okay? And averages them, right? You with me? So what happens? I mean, what, what's the confidence if I look at this classifier? What do I get? I mean, I'm just summing all these Gaussians, uh, and each one has mean uh, 1 over square, 10 over square, so let us write it down properly. So, and then the classifier is always, I forgot the sign, so this is sign wx, right? And my, what I do is I just look at the last components. So what's the probability that I'm wrong? Uh, yes, uh, 10, so I, I went 10 standard, so I, of course the proof here, I mean all these papers don't have, this is always Julia language, they don't have 90 and they don't have 10, right? So they write parameters. I always write them such so it's more dramatic. So 90 is 90, but this is 10 standard deviations away. Right? It's 10 standard deviations away. So if I have D samples, of course, I mean, in order to misclassify, 10 standard deviation, the, the probability to misclassify is tiny. Right? You with me? So let's write it down. Um, so the probability that the sign of this thing, WTX equal Y, right, is simply the probability that the average 1 over d, the average of these Gaussians, y times 10 over square d, 1, is uh, bigger than 0, right? right? So I'm summing all these Gaussians, and they're all pointing in the right direction, right? And so what's the probability that they will point in the right direction? With this, uh, with this thing, and this is 10 standard deviations away, so this is bigger than 99, I mean, I chose it this way, 99, whatever, percent, right? You with me? Oh, let's, let's, yes, sorry, let's, the Y is already gone, right, sorry. Yes, so let's multiply by Y inside, and you're, you're gone. Right, so I'm weakly pointing in some direction, very weakly, but if I average them all out, then I will strongly point in that direction and I get absolutely gorgeous um, accuracy. So I would be foolish to look at the first component because that gives me only 90%, right? So I have a weak source of information and a strong source of information. But aren't you supposed to include it a little bit instead of the zero? Like isn't the optimal thing to like... Okay, allow me my intuitions, yes. I mean, there's proofs, there's the statements, but. Okay, sure, you can. Actually, no, actually, here. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, you're, you're, I think here you are actually wrong. If you have a weak source and a strong source, you ignore the weak source, I think, in the limit. But, okay, let's, let's may, maybe. It's very dependent, then it adds something, but it adds so little. Yeah. It, you anyway didn't write how many nines yeah. you have there. Yeah, yeah, so maybe in the limit D infinity, at least, this is true, okay. Large D. Let's, let's agree on that one. But I'm, I'm just trying to give you an intuition here. You have a weak source, which is robust. And then, and now what is of course the problem with this thing? I mean, this, these are uh, tiny fluctuations. Now, if you have an adversary, uh, uh, then what happens with an adversary? Let's, let's allow an epsilon uh, L infinity adversary. So what will this adversary do? Of course, the adversary will screw up these little features here, right? So, and it can screw up really badly. Um, what would the adversary just do? Let's see. Um, an epsilon, epsilon can, no, no, let me do, twi oh, how did you know, did you look at my notes? That's exactly what I wrote. So epsilon is 20 over square root D, right? So it kind of takes the 10, and, but it's tiny, right? It's not even constant. A tiny adversary of one over square root of D already screws you up, because what will you do? Um, the adversary will just uh, point in the other direction, right? And completely wash out uh, this 
this mean there? Okay, let me not write it down because I'll make a mistake again and also my time is running out. Okay, so what the language people use is uh, that this is a beautiful feature here, one over d, sum of x d for the first, for the second and so on feature. This is a beautiful, uh, is it uh, uh, x i, sorry. So this thing that I did here with d, this is a feature, right? I mean, I extract this. This is what people call a very useful, useful, but non-robust feature, right? So if an adversary comes along and screws up these last coordinates, and he can do this, she, I should sometimes say she, but adversary, I mean, sorry. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so 20 over square root d, right, is enough. Uh, twice as much as, as the mean there to completely screw us up. So this very useful feature is totally non-robust. And when the adversary comes and does this, then my best thing to do afterwards is to just take the 90% feature. That one will be also tiny bit, a bit, you know, with one over 20, nothing will happen to this feature. I just look at it and with probability still 90% plus maybe something tiny, one over square root d, I will be correct, right? So x zero, is what people call a robust feature. And I will make this precise next lecture. Robust feature. Right? So this is a robust feature because the adversary can't screw, can't screw it up. It's like kind of robust. Okay? And, uh, but the problem is now that when I want to be robust, I only get 90%. Whereas before, I got to 99%. So this is what people, I mean, okay, this is, I mean, I'm, this is one instance of the robustness accuracy trade-off, which seems inherent in the problem, right? I mean, it seems like there's no way around it, which is annoying. You, I mean, you have to, this is really annoying, uh, as, as because this give, puts serious limitations on our um, ability to, uh, to do something. And uh, so then, just as a teaser, and I don't even know if I'll get to it, but what we did with Nikos is we tried to find these features through the NTK, through the spectrum of the NTK, and kind of see that the robust features are learned first. Just in the spirit of what I said yesterday with uh, low frequency features being learned first, and you can see this through the spectrum of the NTK. So we did something a bit similar, a bit dirtier, however, to see where these robust features lie when you look at it with the NTK uh, language. But that aside, um, tomorrow I'll start from here. This is basically a big disaster, and then people kind of reason about it and try to mend this to some extent. And, uh, you know, anyway. All right, thank you.